Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We have a very exciting discussion this evening as we wrap up the month of November, which is Men's Mental Health Month. I'm very excited to be joined by Dr. Aaron Cartman, who's going to be speaking with me a bit more about this important topic. A bit more about me, my name is Erin Hartley. I am a licensed marriage and family therapist. I am a VP of clinical strategy at Maru Health. I'll share a bit more about Maru Health at the end of this presentation. My clinical background has worked over the majority of my career working with people with mood disorders, things like anxiety and depression. I joined the Maru Health team in 2017 and really have a passion for leveraging technology and helping people uh, improve their mental health and well-being through creative and innovative tools. A bit more about our guest presenter this evening, Dr. Aaron Cartman, who I will be interviewing a bit later on tonight. Dr. Cartman is a licensed clinical psychologist. He also is a therapist at Murray Health. He works in, uh, has worked over the course of his career in a wide variety of clinical settings from outpatient clinics to psychiatric hospitals. He's currently working in juvenile justice. He is, uh, works primarily across a wide range of clinical modalities, including cognitive behavioral therapy, psychodynamics. And when he's not working, he enjoys spending time with his family and hiking through the Sierra Nevadas. Dr. Cartman is our clinical expert on men's mental health, and we're very excited to be speaking with him this evening. I'm gonna pass it to Dr. Cartman, who will share a bit more about our agenda, and I will uh, wrap things up at the end of our presentation, sharing a little bit more about a treatment solution that may be of interest to you. Thank you, Ms. Hartley, for that great introduction. And, uh, Aaron Cartman, Dr. K, nice to be here uh, sharing about men's mental health. Um, and uh, let me, our, our agenda for uh, this presentation is um, four parts to it, really. Um, the, the main, you know, we're going to discuss the problem, um, as, as I see it, sort of regarding men's mental health and some of the barriers, um, the stigmas with men's mental health. And then we'll talk about um, the cost of that, you know, that, that these barriers and these stigmas have a cost on our society and just on our well-being in general. Um, and then the next, after that, we'll have a discussion, uh, Aaron and I, both Aaron's, will have a discussion about um, some solutions and some some ways that we might be able to look at men's mental health and the stigma of mental health in general um, and you know just to try to bring us up from you know we're going to talk about difficult things and we're going to try to bring it up with some more hopeful um, solutions and, and um, plans and alternatives um, and then finally uh, Aaron will discuss the Miru health mental health program as um, one you know very good alternative and one one way to kind of help deal with the stigma and the cost of poor mental health. So with that, uh, let me begin. <clears throat> so um, I tried to include a lot of a lot of people that I thought, um, you know, we see as strong and, and um, manly, if you will, you know, The Rock is, is very strong and manly and he's dealt with depression. So here's, you know, there's, there's a lot of famous people. And I think this helps with the stigma, you know, looking and hearing famous people talk about their struggles with mental health. I think that helps make it less of a, um, a stigma, less of a bad thing, you know, something that we should be ashamed of. So The Rock said he found that depression was one of the most important things that you can, you know, realizing that you're not alone with your depression, um, that you don't have to go through it by yourself. And I think him sharing that across our society was a way of him really using his power to, to help people not feel so alone. Um, I think that's one of the hardest things, you know, with the stigma comes shame. So here you are depressed and you're ashamed and you're hiding it. And that's the worst thing you can do if you're depressed. So, um, so problem number one, this, the stigma um, regarding men's mental health. Some of this can be our culture. Um, there's cultural stigmas, you know, different cultures have different stigmas, you know, our culture in general um, in, I'd say the entire world, there's, there's, I, I can't think of a culture that just is so pro mental health. Um, there's also internal pressures and internal culture. You know, we feel internally that, um, ashamed or that we should, as a man, we should be able to take care of our own problems and pick ourselves up by our bootstraps. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then professionally, um, professional stigma. You know, what if it comes out that, you know, I have mental health problems, you know? Um, what if what if my bosses find out, you know, what I what if it, it might be hard to get hired? You know, so there's, there's shame on so many levels with mental health. Um, mental illness is a weakness. So, so these are statements that, that I think capture the stigma of mental health. Um, 
And one statement might be mental illness is a weakness and it's permanent and shameful. Um, you know, can we think of it that way? I think a lot of us do. Um, people from my culture, people from, you know, this culture don't see therapists and you can fill in the blank of your culture because I think almost every culture has some statement like that. Um, or people in my family don't see therapists, you know, or my parents tell me not to see a therapist. Um, or, you know, sometimes you'll see clients come into a therapist that, oh, you know, please don't give me a diagnosis. I don't want that to follow me. Don't tell me I'm crazy. You know, um, think of like an alcoholic that won't admit that they're an alcoholic because then you say you're an alcoholic. Now that's, now that's a label that you have. And, and that sounds worse. So just pretend that you don't have a problem and, and it'll go away, um, which, which isn't necessarily helpful. Uh, and then I'm not crazy. You know that statement. I'm not crazy. I don't need to see a therapist. Uh, here's a nice quote on the side. Uh, Bill Clinton said, mental illness is nothing to be ashamed of, but the stigma and bias shame us all. So mental illness itself is not shameful, but it's attached to stigma and bias. Um, psychology also has played some roles with this. Um, there was, you know, I think psychology mirrors culture. So if you think back to the 1950s, psychology mirrored the uh, culture of the 1950s and, and earlier where um, different genders, cultures, ages, you know, children were, were not thought to be able to do therapy with children because they didn't have a full mind, you know, um, LGBT issues, you know, psychology used to pathologize gay people that it was considered mental illness in the 40s and 50s, which you know, thank God is not the case now. Um, even hysteria, the term hysteria comes from um, like the wandering uterus in a, in a woman's body was considered part of hysteria. I mean, so, so psychology has come a long way, like, you know, thankfully, and um, I think our culture has to catch up. So here's the stigma of mental health. Um, a giant burden. Uh, so a personal example of stigma. Um, I just wanted to share a story. You know, my I have a family member that um, was staying with me recently um, and suffering from, you know, they're being treated for cancer. Um, and, and it's, you know, they're doing okay. And it's, it's a treatable cancer. But um, this person was not sleeping well, was staying up at night, um, was ruminating over just thinking about it all the time, miserable, you know, just really suffering, you know, you know, they canceled a trip that they were going to go on because they just weren't going to enjoy the trip. So just, you know, struggling with, with her mentality, if you will, her mind is struggling with the cancer, um, and really having a hard time with it. My wife and I are both therapists. So you think, you know, superpowers, right? We're both therapists. There's no way that this person's going to suffer. You know, we can get her into therapy, right? Um, talking to this person, um, they admit that they're unhappy, um, and they even had some leftover, uh, you know, I think, I think they had some leftover Xanax, and they took a Xanax at one point, went to bed, woke up feeling great, went for a walk, and was awesome, and, and so, you know, she said, you know, if I could just get some more of this, I think things would be much better, you know, for a short-term illness like that, um, a little bit of anti-anxiety med would be great, you know, maybe talking to a therapist as well, so it seems like a no-brainer, right, go see a therapist, go see a psychiatrist, get, get some help, um, take care of your depression and your anxiety, you know, and, and have a decent experience as you, as you deal with cancer, which is, which is hard. Um, and why not get help? But um, unfortunately, here's what happened. Uh, I'm not crazy. I'm just a little unwell. That's a song. I'm not going to sing it because I think everyone would log off immediately. But um, this is what she said. I'm not crazy. I'm, I'm not going to go see a therapist because I'm not that crazy. Um, she refuses to, she did not want to see a therapist. She doesn't want to see a psychiatrist. It's not that bad. She's not that crazy. I'm not that bad off. You know, that's for crazy people. Um, so she won't get help. Um, she tried to get the oncologist to write her the prescription for the medication because that, that didn't feel crazy. You know, going to that doctor was okay, but going to, you know, doctor me or, or doctor, any doctor or any therapist or any MFT or, or even a Meru program where you could get some support that, um, that was crazy. That, that she went to. Um, I, I do have an update that I'll share. Um, but first, I want to share this next part. So here's another perspective. Um, and I like this picture just with men's mental health. Here's, here's a, a guy being a bro to himself, you know, and I think that's where it starts. We have to start inside um, on taking the stigma out of our own heads, you know, because a lot of this, a lot of these barriers start with us first. Um, so instead of looking at, um, this family member's issue as, as um, 
this mental illness and anxiety and depression. What if she had had a broken arm? Um, if, if you have a family member with a broken arm and you say, you know what, you need to go see a doctor for that broken arm, are, are they going to try to tough it out? Um, are they going to say it's not that bad or I can get over it or it's not that serious? I mean, that's that seems like, um, I hate to use the word insanity because we're taking away the stigma, but that seems um, not wise, right? <laughs> so um, but the update is, though, it's interesting. You know, uh, the last time I practiced this presentation, we went over it. I, I, my wife and I had another conversation with, with this family member and just talked about the stigma, you know, and, and uh, when Erin and I have a discussion at the end, I, I can share some more of this, but we just in talking about the stigma and her, her um, fear of seeing a therapist, she actually is, is, is going to go see somebody now. It, it sort of, it, there was a little bit of movement there, you know, so maybe one of the best ways to address the stigma of mental health is just to keep talking about it like we are today. Um, that might be a solution. So because there's, I think she's going to see somebody. So that was good. Um, so here's the second problem that, um, you know, as we, as we talk about men's mental health, so the stigma is one big side of it. And then I think the second side is, is this concept um, that I see everywhere called toxic masculinity. Um, and this is not to say that being masculine and all masculinity is toxic. I think, I think there's plenty of healthy, you know, being proud of being a man in your manhood, but there's, there's a degree to it that can cause us to suffer. Um, and that's what I want to address today is the, the, the suffering that comes from toxic ma masculinity. Um, some other words might be machismo or manliness. Um, it, it, here's a quote that I like that I don't know who did it, but I just thought it rang true, which was, you know, men who do not turn to face their own pain are, are, are too, are often prone to inflicted on other people. You know, so what we don't face, we project out and we, we hurt other people with it. Um, so toxic masculinity you know, think of men, we're, we're unemotional, we don't express our feelings. And these are all, you know, stereotypes, but stereotypes are there for a reason. I mean, that's, that they're created because that many people think and feel something a certain way. Not to say that it's always correct, but, you know, men are unemotional. They can only express anger. They need to be dominant. They need to be aggressive. You know, homophobia is built into toxic masculinity. Uh, they're power hungry. Alpha male, you know, you never cry. You don't show weak emotions. Um, you know, your sexual identity, your sexual preferences can make you less of a man if you're not this, this certain, you know, stereotypical man that, they, that we have built, I think, from the 1950s. Um, asking for help is a weakness. You know, you, before, before the day of smartphones, you know, I, I, I remember driving around and just the joke that no man would ever ask for directions. Um, think about, you know, so that's, again, asking for, for help um, from a therapist is like asking for directions to yourself. Um, and that, you know how insulting to your mana to need help, um, and I say that I say that a little bit sarcastically. That um, my hope is that that with this presentation and and just these discussions that we're going to have and that we keep having, um, that it becomes okay to ask for help. You know, I, I definitely wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't for the help that I got from so many people around me. So, um, and um, this toxic masculinity leaves us leaves us alone and less supported and really having to tough it out and and why why should we have to tough it out if 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 things if there's an easier softer way in this world um and one where we can be healthier and more successful what what benefit is there to just tough it out so um i like this this put this slide right here just you know you see the the real man and then the man behind him where he's these are all the things he's supposed to be. And, and, you know, he's, he's thinking about it. You know, that's what I'm wanting us to do right now is to, to, to ponder some of this, you know, are some of these traits or some of these things that we idealize, are they good for us? Are they healthy? So looking at the health and, and whether this is helpful for us, and, you know, here, as we take off our masks, um, there's a cost, there's a cost to all this. There's a cost to the stigma. There's a cost to the toxic masculinity. Um, here's some statistics for it. Worsening depression for and anxiety for men. We have four times the suicide rate of, of women. Substance abuse and self-medication. You know, that's another term. I love, you know, how when you talk about substance abuse as therapists, we call it self-medication. Um, such an interesting idea. That it's someone that's medicating themselves because maybe they're ashamed or they don't trust modern doctors. You know, they don't want a diagnosis. They don't want to see a psychiatrist and get actual medication. So they'll, they'll, 
go get something off the street sometimes or they'll, they'll use alcohol and and it works at first right i mean sometimes it works but then it leads to 62,000 men dying from alcohol abuse versus 26,000 women uh, men are three times as likely to use drugs you know there's a greater health risk from from all of this um, cardio cardiovascular disease metabolic disease stress hypertension strokes heart attacks and i guess cardiovascular disease all these all this all this um this anxiety and stress that we hold on to all these feelings that we don't share um increase our steroid level our, our cortisol levels and our heart rate um our blood pressure it's all tied into our our emotional regulation so the less ability we have to regulate our feelings talk about our feelings work with a therapist, work with ourselves, practice mindfulness. A lot, of, a lot of the techniques, even in Meru, um, you know, the biofeedback, the, the less um, able we are to deal with our feelings, the, the more our body suffers and um, they don't get stronger from suffering. You know, I think, I, you know, I think there's a, a level of it, but the more I think we, the more all these, these, the stress, this cortisol level, um, there's a great book called Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers that talks about um, how our society has changed from hunters and gatherers to sitting in traffic. So for sitting in traffic as, as, as a human being, stressing out, thinking about fight or flight, but we're just in a car going nowhere, um, it's, it's having a detrimental effect on our body. And this is where mental health comes in. So personal, you know, uh, interpersonal violence um, is on the rise and I think is related to, to poor mental health for men. Um, increase in psychological distress, as I was discussing before, and also just um, overall discouragement and seeking help. Um, so these are some of the costs from um, the stigma and from the toxic masculinity. And so here's here's some examples in our culture. Um, and I'm sure you guys have many more personal examples. Um, and, you know, we have Robin Williams, Kurt Cobain, I, you know, to name a few. Aaron, if you recognize any of these, you know, I see Chris Farley, um, Anthony Bourdain, you know, and a lot, a lot of females too. I mean, the stigma doesn't just impact males, um, but the cost of mental health. I think the guy from Stone Temple Pilots or, or one, of, one of those recent um, singers just committed suicide. Even commit suicide, the term commit suicide, it's, it's almost like a, a crime, like you're committing an act. Um, I think we have to work on a lot of our language. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about our language. Let's talk about redefining manhood. Um, challenging these stigmas and some of the solutions. Thanks so much, Aaron. Really thought-provoking um, conversation so far. And, you know, I'm I'm curious as you were talking about some of the things related, maybe we start a little bit with the, the stigma. It seems, you know, you, you talked a bit about toxic masculinity and, and the stigma associated with mental health issues. And you know, I think we are, we do seem to be entering societally into a new phase here where there's more of topical discussions about the importance of mental health, certainly as we come through the pandemic and saw such a rise in mental health issues. Um, people are talking about that more. There's more of an acceptance, it seems. What are the ways that you see men can be working together to redefine some of the stereotypes that may have previously um, interfered or been an obstacle to seeking support? How do we how do we really break those down as a as a culture, as a society, or or men uh, really starting to do some of that work? Thank you for the question. Um, yeah, you know I. I think some ways we can address the stigma is to make it more cool and more okay to talk about your feelings to, to you know, uh, to be a cool guy who writes in a journal to be a cool guy who um, talks to a therapist who, who shares his uh, thoughts and feelings with his friends, you know, just, um, you know, I think we can erase the stigma by, um, by also looking at it the same way we look at something physical. You know, if you if you sprain your ankle or sprain your arm you know, or have a physical injury, you know, you go, you go see that physical therapist. Um, if you, if you have a mental health issue, if you're a little depressed or anxious or sad, you go see a therapist. And it, and it, uh, I think if we just all share about it, oh yeah, I've been in therapy. You know, I, I've been in therapy. I did 10 years of my therapy. Um, and, and it was one of the best gifts I gave myself. And I think just if we can each sort of, the more you share about something, the less shame it has. So I think if, if we can keep sharing about things, they no longer become these dark secrets. They just become, you know, Shaquille O'Neal or, um, 
I think he, he saw a therapist and did mindfulness because he was having such a hard time with his free throws, right? You know, Phil Jackson made mindfulness and meditation cool. Um, so I think, I think we have to make it just like society made seeing therapists um, not like the Marlboro man, you know, it made it unmanly, you know, or it was somehow, somehow we, we sort of got this social impression that it's, that it's not okay. I think as a society, we can do the very same work to, to erase that stigma. Um, again, looking at like physical issues, even just to just add one last thing, you know, like thinking about diabetes, you know, if you, if you think about diabetes, um, type one diabetes, I think requires regular ins insulin to be, to be maintained. And you can have a very healthy life if you maintain your type one diabetes with regular treatment, right? And the same is true for a, a lot of other mental health issues. There's things like lifelong substance abuse, lifelong alcoholics who need to go to regular meetings and 12 step work. And as long as they do that, they can have a very normal life. Um, and what's interesting is the relapse rates are very similar with, with diabetes and, and alcoholism. Um, it's such a simple solution. You just take them insulin or you just go to these meetings, but, it, but so many people um, have a hard time doing it. Yeah. Really, really, really true. You know, one of the things that strikes me, and I'm curious to hear your perspectives on this, is, you know, I'm, I know intimately in my own life, uh, many men who, you know, I've heard a few times, like the solution of, you know, talking more, communicating more, seeing a therapist. I know many men in, in my personal life who really are not verbal processors, that the idea of even uh, being able to communicate uh, around feelings is just, it's unfamiliar, it's not comfortable. Are there other ways that men can be attending to their mental health that don't have to do with talking, don't have to do with communication or therapy? Uh, you know, I know we'll talk a little bit later about our treatment solution, which we feel like is a really great approach for men, but other things outside of treatment that you could think men could be taking care of their mental health in different ways. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think I, I think that you don't just have to go see a therapist and do one on one individual therapy anymore, especially in the, the you know, the new wave of of. I think even with the pandemic, with with so much telehealth being available, so I mean, you could see, you could see a therapist. You can do group therapy. You can do. Um, there's all these different programs like Maru, but a whole bunch of other programs where you can just do different exercises and mindfulness programs, um, and and learn ways to just sort of deal with with um, a lot of mental health issues that aren't that aren't just one on one individual therapy anymore, um, and even just even just talking about mental health with, with friends and family and, and loved ones. Um, it, you know, there's, there's so much reading material, there's, there's so much good material out there on the internet too. I mean, there, you know, there's, there's a lot of good sources for, um, for dealing with it, you know, and, to, and I think technology, you know, even, even there's biofeedback, you know, I was even looking on my, my latest watch that I got has like a HRV where you can see basically how healthy you are, um, how your heart rate is going. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of ways that we can um, work on our mental health, a lot of avenues. Tell me a little bit more, you know, there's such a connection between our mental health and our physical health. You've talked about that a few times, uh, even using the parallel, if you broke your arm, you know, you, you put your arm in a cast and you get treatment. Um, but I think there's there's so many ways that we may be experiencing mental health issues that are that are expressed through our body, right? Mm -hmm. Through physical symptoms that we may not be aware of. Um, maybe you can talk to your experience working with men who weren't able to say or communicate, you know, I think I'm struggling with anxiety or I think I'm struggling with depression. However, those things were maybe expressed through physical symptoms. Can you talk a little bit more about the correlation there? Mm -hmm. And I'll, I like that question. I think that question, even, even more than your last question, like really gets to how a lot of men might seek mental health. Um, I think a lot of guys will come to mental health. Um, e even last night, I had a client that that had seen a GI doctor and been to the ER thinking they were having a heart attack and had all, you know, and, and three or four or five different avenues of trying to get what's going on with my body. Why am I having my heart palpitations and, and the stomach? And, you know, and they couldn't figure out what was going on. Um, and when all, you know, and it's not a bad idea, of course, if you're ever having heart issues, you know, go to the ER and, and even just with depression, sometimes seeing a general practitioner to get your thyroid checked is always good. But once all that's eliminated, um, or while that's all being eliminated, also seeing a therapist, you know, or getting, or getting some sort of mental health treatment, 
um, doing a group, you know, um, looking at, at whether or not it could be psychological. Um, a lot, you know, stomach issues, muscle tension, um, anxiety attacks, lack of energy, um, you know, just snapping at your wife and children, feeling burned out at work. There's so many, there's so many sort of clues, you know, even with, you know, like with mindfulness, we'll often clue into our body as a way of an anchor point, if you will. I think our bodies can also serve as like a signal, some signal function. So, you know, if you're, if your stomach, if your heart is racing, if you're getting these headaches, you know, and a lot of physical symptoms, it, it, it may be your body telling you that, that something needs help too. Um, and our bodies and minds are strongly linked. Um, back in the day when I was younger, you know, you'd say something psychosomatic or it's all in your head, you know, not to worry about it. Um, but you, we, I, we have to worry about it because um, strokes are in our head, right? You know, heart attacks are in our head, you know, the, the tension and the stress and the anxiety and, you know, and the drug abuse that we might do from untreated mental illnesses in our head, if you will, like the, the disconnect there, I don't think there's, um, a need for such a strong disconnect between mind and body. I think they're so strongly linked. So I think our body, you know, just, uh, I love that question because I think our bodies um, really do tell us, you know, our mental health. Yeah. Great yeah. There's a, there's a strong connection and correlation there for sure. Um, you know, well, my, last, sorry to interrupt. Can I add last, it's also then the converse is that good mental health can, can lead to much greater bodily health. Right. So the, the correlation can go both ways. Yeah. Yeah. How have you seen, how have you seen, have you seen that in your clinical practice where, where people, people physically begin to feel better as they're attending to things that they're working on psychologically? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, just, you know, improved sleep, mm -hmm. um, improved digestive issues. Um, and there's a ton of research about life expectancy, you know, with, when, with people that are suffering from mental illness and don't get treatment, um, your life expectancy is a lot lower. So, I mean, that's, you know, that's a lot of physical proof right there. Yeah. Yeah. There's uh, some really strong links in research with so social isolation and relationships and connection being so important. Yeah. For Loneliness is a huge. Health, right? Yeah. Um, you know, my, my final question to you, Aaron, is I think this is such an important conversation and, and one that I'm so glad that we're having. I know others are having, you know, what for those parents in the audience, caregivers, teachers, aunts, uncles, you know, those who, who know and love little ones, what, what can we be doing differently as a society as we bring up a new generation of youth and men, we're raising more men uh, into the world, what can we be doing differently to, to really shift the conversations about men, mental health, to, to really destigmatize to disband some of those you know that toxic masculinity slide that you had was so disheartening to see what can we be doing differently i, I love that question i think that question in, in some ways has a, such a solution to it already like built in um i, I personally i think one of the best you know and, and for me as as, as someone growing up you know I, I started seeing a therapist when i was very young and you know um and I think that's the, I think that's one of the, the ways we can really address this toxic masculinity. When you think about, you know, like men don't cry, boys are allowed to cry, right? Boys, boys are allowed to feel more feelings. Boys are more often more in touch with their feelings. So, so I think um, as we build ourselves up into men um, as parents, you know, and I have, I have three young boys, um, we have to make it okay for boys to see a therapist if they want to see a therapist or to, to join a, a, a support group. If there's a children's support group for, for issues that they might have, um, you know, to go talk to their school counselors, their school psychologists, to have feeling journals, to, to draw pictures when they're having hard feelings that they want to deal with. And as parents, um, I also think it's so important for us to be in our own therapy um, because we're also the, the, we're also the lenses. We're also the filters that, that our kids are going to have their feelings be translated through. So if your kid's having a panic attack or an anxiety attack, or just really angry, you feel the anger with them, right? You know, when, when even my two-year-old, when he cries, I mean, it's being projected into my body and I feel it. And if I'm not okay with being angry, then I'm going to push that back at him and I'm not going to accept his anger. And I'm going to tell him not to cry. And I'm going to have a very shut down, closed off um, reaction. That's going to, that's going to probably impact him negatively. But if I'm, if I'm, doing my mindfulness, if I'm participating in programs um, that, that, that teach me to take a deep breath when I'm angry, to, to look around, 
um, to, to feel my, my body in the chair, you know, you can do all sorts of grounding techniques. Then I can turn to my kid and, and um, be angry with him and let him feel his anger and say, it's okay that you're angry. And, and I'm mm -hmm. not angry just because you're angry and you know, I'm okay tolerating your anger. So um, I could think I could spend another hour just talking about your question. I love the question, you know, how, how we can address um, this with our children. I think our children are the answer. I think, I think a lot of the work can be preventative. I think a lot of the work to changing um, the stigma and the masculinity and, and promoting healthier minds and bodies and souls is just working with our kids. Mm. You know, okay to talk about. Yeah, I hear giving, giving permission, giving language for emotions, really educating kids. Like, you know, I know you and I have talked about uh, in different conversations how much we love that Disney movie Inside Out that came out maybe about five years ago. That's really like an education for adults, for children around the importance of our emotions and how to how to be curious about our emotions, how to how to sort of, you know, see them as as friends and foes. And I think that education is is so important, isn't it? Being able to have classes, curriculums, discussions around emotions, how you experience them and them in their body and, and really um, destigmatizing that there's like an idea of good and bad ones. Yeah. I mean, could you imagine if, if if a school had a therapy group as one of their classes where you where you'd have a therapist and everyone would do well, it? I have heard recently I have a, a client that has a, a little one in sort of pre-K and they have a group really related to the Inside Out movie where they're teaching them about their emotions and how they experience them in their body. And they're starting with that language. It was really inspiring for me to hear that. Um, and, and maybe that's the future state that we could get to, uh, that would really help us sh shift, um, these stigmas entirely. That would yeah. be awesome. I know in the, the juvenile justice settings I work in, um, I work with, you know, teenage offenders and they're, um, they're doing mindfulness, they're doing meditation. I mean, they're, they're every single one of the, the clients that's incarcerated, they all have therapists and they, they work on these things, you know, and they, they come. They come out into our society, you know, I think a lot more in touch with their emotions. Right. Thanks so much. I think that's a nice segue to shift now to talk a little bit more about um, different types of solutions. We're going to talk a little bit more about the Maroon Health Program, uh, which is, I'm going to go over a little bit more for, for those of you listening that may have Maroon Health uh, as a uh, covered benefit for you, a little bit more about the treatment modality that we've created here that we really see as a great avenue for, for men who may be looking for different ways to attend to their mental health that aren't in traditional talk therapy sessions where you're meeting with your therapist once weekly. Uh, so everyone who comes to the Maru Health Program starts by uh, filling out a bit of information. Everything is confidential, HIPAA compliant uh, on a website, on a landing page, and then you download the Maru Health app. You do set up a video session and intake call with a dedicated therapist, one of our licensed therapists, who would be your guide really supporting you over the course of a 12-week program, all accessible here uh, via an app. So there's 12 weekly themes. I'm going to go over those next in just a moment. 12 weekly themes delivered in audio and video lessons. You're supported by your therapist with an additional up to three sessions over the course of the 12 weeks. But the majority of the communication, if you'd prefer, can be text-based. So you can text your therapist and get support in app. Um, so this is something that you can do at your own time and pace. Again, it doesn't require those weekly or bi-monthly sessions with a with a therapist. We've also integrated a really cool technology. This is something Dr. Cartman had alluded to earlier, which is biofeedback. And this is an image of a biofeedback device here that you clip to your earlobe and the top of your collar, and it measures your heart rate. And really you're learning breathing practices through the app that increase the variance of your heart rate. So a heart that has more variance between its beats is predictive of a heart that responds quicker and better to stress. And so you're learning breathing techniques that help your body respond to stress and really combat the autonomic nervous system that can really get elevated in um, stressful situations. We've also, because we know that there's such a link between our mind and our body that we don't walk around as humans with our head cut off from our bodies, we've integrated lessons about sleep and nutrition so that you're really learning how to take care of yourself from the, from the, from the body up uh, and how this has an impact on our mood. 
On the next slide here, I'll just go over very briefly. As I mentioned, there's 12 weekly themes and lessons. Here is a list of those weekly themes on the right-hand column of your screen. There's over 50 audio and video lessons integrated into the 12-week program. You're learning new practices and tools. And this is one of the things that I think inspires so many of us as therapists about this treatment program is it's not just about meeting with a therapist on a weekly basis. If you're choosing that route of care, it's actually the work that you're doing in between sessions that has such an impact. And so you're introduced to different techniques and lessons and practices that help you improve your mental health and well-being. You also have access to live and interactive uh, webinars like this one and live interactive groups. All of the program is personalized by the dedicated therapist who's, who's your guide and, and support system over the course of the 12 weeks as you go through this journey. What we thought we would do now is show a very brief video. It's about two and a half minutes long that gives you a real sense of the program uh, experience. So I'm gonna let Aaron play that next. Welcome to Maru Health, an online mental health care provider that offers an evidence-based program proven to reduce anxiety, depression, and burnout. Our holistic treatment program uses cutting edge science from the fields of sleep, nutrition, behavioral science, mindfulness, cognitive behavioral therapy, and heart rate variability all supported by licensed therapists and psychiatrists. Participants can access the program via a smartphone app from anywhere at any time. After discovering Maroon Health from an employee portal, provider referral, or outreach campaign, participants are directed to sign up for the program on our landing page. Then they can immediately download the Maroon Health app, take a personal assessment, and schedule a video call to speak with one of our therapists within one to two days. Together, they develop a personalized care plan based on the participants' unique needs and goals. Shortly after, participants can begin the program. The Maru Health program consists of 12 weeks, and each week has a different theme. As the participant moves from week to week, they unlock new activities. On the home screen, they can see the activities recommended for them that day. These activities range from educational videos to tools and practices that help them put their learning into action. For the biofeedback practices, we ship each participant a wearable device that connects to their phone via Bluetooth. These paced breathing practices help the participant to measure and regulate their body's response to stress. A personal therapist monitors the participant's progress throughout the program and recommends content and practices to enhance engagement and effectiveness. The participant can chat at any time with their therapist, who will respond within 24 hours. We also provide a peer support group where participants can give and receive support from others going through the same program. We want our participants to become empowered and have the tools to take care of their own well-being. They will have a lifetime access to the app and all of its content, videos, and practices after they complete a 12-week program. For further information, visit www.maruhealth.com. Right. So just a bit more, we'll be sharing all of this information after today's presentation on how you can go to your dedicated landing site for Maru Health and enroll and follow the steps that were just displayed there on that video. Certainly, um, we do, as I should have mentioned, we when you download the Maru Health app, you would be linked to a care coordinator on our team who would be messaging you so that you understand if you have any copay or cost share associated with the program, and also to answer any questions that you might have. We really appreciate you coming uh, to this presentation. We hope that this was a valuable discussion for you. And uh, Dr. Cartman and I are available by email if you have any questions that you that may have come up over the course of this discussion this evening. 
Thank you, Ms. Harley. It was a pleasure.